In the coffee industry, Starbucks is seen as invincible. Since its inception in Seattle, USA, in 1971, Starbucks has achieved enormous success worldwide. As of this year, it operates over 34,000 stores across roughly 80 countries. However, Starbucks hasn't been successful in every market. It faced a significant setback in Australia, the only country where it struggled globally. In 2008, unable to sustain a loss of about $123 million, Starbucks closed 70% of its Australian stores at once. What went wrong? Starbucks began its international expansion in 1996, starting with Tokyo, Japan, and then extending to the UK and South Korea, achieving great success even in China, a country traditionally more focused on tea. However, this success led to overconfidence. Initially, Starbucks expected its venture into the Australian coffee market to be a breeze. In July 2000, they opened their first store in Sydney. Australia was a top-tier coffee market, with 75% of the population drinking three to four cups daily, contributing to annual coffee sales of about $6 billion, representing 8% of the global coffee market. Besides Dunkin' Donuts and Gloria Jeans, there were no significant competitors in the chain coffee shop sector. Starbucks, having succeeded even in markets with no established coffee culture, couldn't imagine failing in Australia, where a coffee culture was already well established. They aggressively expanded, opening new stores in the suburbs even before their urban stores had stabilized. However, aside from cities like Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane, Australia doesn't have a high population density. Starbucks seemed too ambitious for the market size, but they didn't take heed of this. When expanding internationally, companies typically conduct thorough market research, open a few stores to gauge local responses and adjust their strategies accordingly. However, Starbucks skipped these steps and directly applied its successful American model to Australia, rapidly opening 87 stores over seven years to capture the coffee market as quickly as possible. The essence of Starbucks success formula is providing delicious coffee in a comfortable space for urban professionals, particularly targeting millennials in the workforce. Before Starbucks entered the scene, most coffee in the US was of the Robusta variety grown in Brazil. While easy to cultivate, this variety is known for its inferior taste. The Arabica variety was recognized as tastier, but its production was irregular, posing significant business risks. Starbucks boldly introduced Arabica, thus establishing itself as a brand known for delicious coffee. Prior to Starbucks, American coffee shops weren't particularly cozy or comfortable. Starbucks wanted to create spaces where friends could gather and relax as comfortably as if they were at home, a concept that resonated well in the U.S. In reality, the notion of serving delicious coffee in a comfortable space implies that the coffee will be expensive. This value proposition primarily appeals to professionals and urban office workers. Consequently, Starbucks didn't gradually expand in a single city, but instead strategically entered the downtown areas of various major cities. This three-pronged strategy of Starbucks worked well not only in the U.S. but also in other countries. At the time, Starbucks achieved great success in countries like China, Japan, and South Korea, where coffee culture was less developed compared to the U.S. The same was true for the UK, the most successful European market for Starbucks, which traditionally had a stronger tea culture than coffee. However, this seemingly universal key to success didn't work in Australia. Simply put, the 6,500 small cafes dotting every urban alley in Australia offered a higher quality than Starbucks. Australia's coffee culture was shaped by Italian and Greek immigrants in the mid-20th century. They started making premium quality coffee with freshly ground beans, tailored to their regular customers' preferences. Australians, like Italians, developed a taste for strong coffee flavors, such as espresso. This led to the creation of Australia's national coffee, the flat white, a rich latte. This tradition has been entrenched in Australia for over 100 years, but Starbucks underestimated it and focused on American-style mixed coffees like cappuccinos and caramel macchiatos, which were quite different from the Australian palate. Moreover, these were too sweet for Australians who preferred espresso. Starbucks made the mistake of assuming that Australians, being English speakers, would have the same preference for sweet beverages as Americans. 
The worst part was that Starbucks was significantly more expensive than local Australian cafes. The average cost of a coffee in Australia was about 3.5 Australian dollars, while Starbucks charged between 4.5 to 5 Australian dollars. For Australians, there was no reason to pay 30-40% more for coffee that didn't even suit their taste. The concept of Starbucks as a comfortable space to spend time with friends wasn't novel in Australia. Australian cafes were already more than just coffee shops. They served as community hubs for friends, family, and even the cafe owners themselves. Australian baristas often knew their regulars' coffee preferences so well that they would prepare their usual orders without even needing to ask. In Australia, personal connections and a sense of intimacy with cafe owners and baristas are crucial aspects of the coffee culture. Therefore, the impersonal mechanical service at Starbucks felt inhuman to Australians. Moreover, Starbucks's pride in their 40% faster service was perceived negatively in Australia. It made coffee feel like cheap, fast food rather than a cultural experience. The perception was exacerbated by the contrast between local baristas, who were seen as artisanal figures, and the younger baristas at Starbucks, who were often doubted for their coffee-making skills. As a result, Australians, after an initial curiosity, returned to their traditional familiar cafes where they knew the baristas who tailored coffee to their taste. Recently, Starbucks has been showing signs of a comeback in Australia. From the 23 stores that remained, the number has grown to about 60. However, the impact of the 2008 failure seems significant. The new Australian Starbucks stores have a completely different target audience. They have shifted focus from Australians, who have strong loyalty to traditional coffee shops, to American and Chinese tourists and students from Asia. Interestingly, Starbucks was originally inspired by the coffee shops found in the nooks and crannies of Italy adapted to American tastes to be lighter and sweeter than European versions. So to put it rather bluntly, Starbucks failure in Australia could be seen as an inferior version of the authentic Italian coffee culture that Australia had embraced, which tried and failed to establish itself. This oversight by a corporation as big as Starbucks is indicative of the complacency born from early success 